Okay, welcome. We're going to talk a little bit about what's new in OpenShift Serverless and some updates about the community. So my name is William Marquito Oliveira. I'm a product manager at Red Hat, and I have here with me... I'm Paul Mori. I lead our serverless engineering team at Red Hat, and I'm on k Steering. Nice. So let's dive in. But before we, we go too deep here, let's review some of the first principles that we really uh, use to, to guide everything we do as far as uh, uh, product in, in Red Hat, especially on the cloud team. So, of course, we really focus on the openness and working with communities and open standards and driving development with those communities. And you're going to hear some updates about that uh, regarding uh, recent developments in the K-Native community. And then on the right side, you have, of course, the hybrid aspect, which is really key for everything we are doing, making sure that the experience that we deliver for those projects as products, they have a great experience on public and on private cloud, uh, and of course, work really well anywhere you want to run OpenShift. Today, we're going to focus on Knative for the most part, like I said. Uh, and just to quickly re re recap what Knative is, again, Knative comes with uh, three main uh, modules. So serving, which is really focused on uh, request-driven compute. So it's a way for you to scale applications up and down, even to zero, uh, based on demand, based on number of requests. Then you have another module called eventing, which is really focused on the infrastructure to send and receive events to, again, start those applications. Uh, and then you have, of course, a CLI client, which allows you to interact and build applications using uh, scripts or using your most favorite terminal. Now, the, the main difference here in where OpenShift Serverless uh, uh, is going, right? So we take those bits from Knative and we extend that with two things for the most part. So one is uh, the ability to write uh, functions as well, which is not something that you have available in Knative per se. Again, something that we are doing with OpenShift Serverless. And uh, we also package all that with an operator that allows you to install, upgrade, uh, and, and configure really uh, Knative inside OpenShift so that you can leverage other services from the platform as well. Things like logging, metering, monitoring, all of those other services. That's the main, again, uh, difference when you think about OpenShift serverless and, and Knative. Now I'll pass the ball to Paul to talk a little bit about some of the updates from the Knative community. Yeah, so let's talk about a, a subject that's probably important to some extent, at least to almost everybody in this room, uh, which is open governance. If you follow the Knative project, you're probably aware that open governance within Knative is something that we've been working on for quite a while. Um, earlier this year, we moved to an elected model for the Technical Oversight Committee, or TOC, uh, and had the first elections. And I want to just take a second here and thank everybody that participated in that election process, everybody that ran, and congratulate everybody that was elected. Uh, we now have a TOC that is elected and composed of folks from IBM and Red Hat, VMware, and Google. Um, and since that time earlier this year where we moved to that elected model for the TOC, we have been working toward adopting a similar model in the steering committee. and. Actually, I have good news because uh, I'm here to talk about the specifics of that new model that we've adopted in a new charter. Um, so for context, before we adopted this charter, the steering committee had been in a bootstrap phase for quite a while since early 2019. Uh, and the model was basically that there were appointed representatives from some uh, specific companies uh, that were that were most active at the time when the steering committee had been formed. So we had uh, some representatives from Google, from IBM, from Red Hat, and VMware. Google had a majority of seats within the steering committee, and members of this committee served as representatives of their employer, um, as opposed to serving as individual. So additionally, there were no rules or guidance for how new members would be added to steering and how we would maintain that committee over time. Um, and one of the things that we heard from folks that were interested in engaging in the project was that uh, the lack of clarity around how you would kind of life cycle this committee um, in, in a way 
sort of encumbered the project because there wasn't a clear way to develop influence at the level of steering. Um, so in the new charter, we uh, we adopted some changes that I think address those concerns. Um, so before I talk about those, remember overall the steering committee's job is to develop the community and to help grow the project and uh, you know grow the organization that evolves around that project within the community. Um, so we have moved to a new model where steering will be elected and where no vendor can hold a majority of seats on the steering committee. Uh, and this may sound familiar if you're uh, if you follow Kubernetes governance. In fact, the Kubernetes governance scheme was one of the things that we looked at a lot for inspiration as we came to arrive at this new model. Um, the size of the steering committee is five currently, but we will probably add seats next year if the project continues to grow. Um, so in our new model, members of the committee serve as individuals instead of representing their employer. Uh, which is also uh, like a, a very strong principle within Kubernetes governance. Um, <clears throat> and this allows us when we're in the community and we're serving on steering to act with our community hats on as opposed to our vendor hats uh, and uh, allows us to just be centered in the fact that we're uh, we're participating as individuals rather than having to represent necessarily our employer's interests. Um, so in this first year, and, and we've literally just in the last couple weeks adopted this new charter. So we're, this is sort of a work in progress to execute it now, but we will have nominations open soon uh, and elections later this year to begin to cycle toward that elected community-based model. We'll have two seats up this year, and uh, there will be at least three seats up for election next year. <clears throat> and that is sort of the TLDR of the steering changes. Um, one of the things that came up in our community discussions around this, and there were a lot of great discussions within the community. In fact, you can go and watch some of the videos online if you would like. Um, but one of the things that came up as we kind of worked through uh, adopting this model in the community was that uh, the question around what is in scope for the Knative trademark is maybe a better fit for a committee with a slightly different organizational scheme um, since trademark is probably most important to vendors. So. What we did, and I will just go ahead and advance the slide now, is, <clears throat> is we have moved the trademark concern into a new committee called the Knative Trademark Committee, or KTC. And this committee is going to govern the scope of the trademark, which currently contains the serving and eventing projects. The seats on the KTC are held by vendors, and members of this committee represent their employers. Um, and currently this committee looks sort of similar to the bootstrap steering in that we have uh, Google represented as the owner of the project. We have IBM and Red Hat represented and VMware represented. Um, going forward, the KTC will consider adding new members uh, every year. So this is something else that I wanted to make sure that we touched on in this update because it helps to address that concern of clarity around how can you as an individual or as uh, someone making choices about where you spend your developers open source time engage with the Knative project and help to develop influence. So um, going back to the, the KTC, um, when they look at adding new members, they'll consider contributions that any particular vendor has made. And there's also a process that allows uh, vendors to articulate maybe some contributions that they've made that are harder to count because not every open source contribution is easy to quantify, right? Like it's, it's sort of easy to think about counting commits. It's less easy to think about um, things that, that don't touch 
GitHub or that are maybe harder to count, like influencing a design discussion, that type of thing. So in the event that that um, that you're thinking about engaging with the project, just know that like when we consider membership in the trademark committee, that any contribution uh, counts and can be counted, uh, and there's a process for folks that like if you if you feel like maybe you did more of things that didn't touch GitHub than things that did, you can articulate that with the exception process. So, um, so Paul, key things. Oh, go ahead, William. Yes. Yes. So, for example, so examples, documentation, or even just participating in some of these meetings that we host publicly upstream those all count as contributions, right? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, since we know that it's, it's one, hard to count some types of contributions, and it's also hard to even foresee all types of contributions, that uh, in the event that there's, there's something you want to make sure the trademark committee considers, you can, you can write up uh, a blurb articulating what you feel your organizational contributions are. Nice. That's awesome. So um, <clears throat> the, the key takeaways I want to leave folks with around governance is that uh, we have significantly improved clarity around the governance in, in these two different dimensions around the, the steering committee and trademark committees. Um, composition of those committees, elections for steering and who can serve, clarity around how vendors can get a seat on the trademark committee, and of course, great community participation during this process. Uh, I, I really want to just take a, a second here and thank everybody that participated, both my, my colleagues at Red Hat and my open source colleagues in the community. Um, I, I'm really happy to be able to give you all this update today, and I, I think that community participation was really key to making that happen. So thanks, everybody that participated. And if you're really interested in how this particular sausage was made, you can go and watch the videos online if you search for Knative Steering Committee. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So elections and everything going on this year, not only in US, but I guess then also in open source projects. That's awesome. Great. Yes. So let's do a quick recap on on serving now. And again, the idea here is really just to to do a brief recap and, and, and Paul and I here, like we'll talk a little bit about some of the main components that are part of serving. Uh, starting with service. So what's what's a service, Paul? What's a key native service? That's a good question, and um, don't let the name fool you. It's different from the Kubernetes resource called service. Uh, it's not the name I would have personally chosen. In fact, there was a long, uh, drawn-out process of arriving at this name in the community that the project had at the time. Um, but when you think of what a Knative service is, it is basically a very high-level resource that is similar in certain ways to a Kubernetes deployment in the sense that it generates these other resources that actually go to do the work. So configuration is basically like the highest level container that we have, no pun intended, uh, from an API standpoint that encapsulates the configuration for the, the serverless service that you're deploying and the routes that bring traffic into it. So moving down into what those mean, um, there is a resource called configuration, and its job is to generate immutable snapshots of an application called revisions that the routes that are also specified in the service bring traffic into. So you can think about that service as sort of a serverless flavor of deployment where you can specify both the things that you'd expect to specify in like a normal Kubernetes deployment, as well as information about how traffic should go into those revisions that are created um, and how the traffic should be split. Yeah, what I what I really like about, about revisions and this idea of snapshot is really this ability to uh, uh, enforce some best practices as far as, again, every time you push uh, a new change to either configuration or code to your application, 
that snapshot is going to be generated. And that allows you, for example, to do things like maybe you want to generate a preview URL for that particular version of the application, but you don't want all the production traffic to go to that uh, particular version of your application, right? Maybe you want to do what they call a dark launch. So it's just uh, people that know the URL. So it's going to automatically be generated a, a random URL for that revision. You can influence that, of course, if you want. But that's like one of the, the patterns that I see that is really useful for, for revisions here. And then another one, of course, is the usual AB split or canary deployments and whatnot. But the, this idea of doing uh, live uh, previews of uh, uh, code that, again, you may not want all the production traffic to consume yet, uh, I think it's it's really, really powerful, right? And and one Absolutely, thing yeah. mind is that that traffic split, it can happen, like all this functionality is provided out of the box just with Knative, but you can also extend that with, uh, with a service mesh, right? You can use a service mesh if you want as well, but that's an option. It's not something that we are imposing in order to perform that traffic split, right, Paul? Yep, yep, and and I agree that the uh, ability to just get traffic splitting uh, out of the box is really, really powerful. If I think about my you know, previous industry experience around we want to uh, test some alpha feature and we want to send maybe 1% of traffic to that and just see what happens. Um, I, I, have, I have spent time writing infrastructure to do that, so getting it out of the box is pretty wild, pretty cool. Yep, yep. One, one thing also that we are uh, uh, working internally as far as uh, 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 experiences in OpenShift is to make sure that there is an easier path for you to generate those snapshots, those revisions using pipelines, right? For example, Tecton. So now you have a CI pipeline that can, from uh, a Git project, build and deploy a new version of your application and automatically generate a preview URL for your app. And maybe you want to post that back, for example, in your PR so that the engineering team or maybe your designers, they can see the layout, they can interact with it. And then only after that, you eventually promote that application to, to broad, right? It's really, really interesting. Cool. So that's essentially serving in a nutshell. Uh, and then, of course, one thing that we did not touch as far as APIs, but that's just inherent of this module, is the ability to scale up and down based on requests, right? So that's what's really triggering this application here. And those requests, again, they can be uh, HTTP, of course, but they can also be cloud events, right? They would be wrapped in an HTTP request, but the payload itself can be a cloud event, which really yep. leads us into uh, the next section here, uh, about eventing, waiting for my slides to reload. There you go. Which uh, eventing is is really the module that we want to talk more about today because again, serving was already uh, considered VA in OpenShift Serverless since March, I believe, and now we are finally taking eventing as well and considering eventing a GA module, right? And with eventing, you essentially have the ability to connect uh, external systems to your uh, application, right? So maybe you want to cover some of those APIs then. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, let's start with sort of the earlier generation APIs, which are single tenant. Um, so the in in this earlier regime that was developed uh, early in the project's lifecycle. Uh, or early in the project's lifetime, there are event sources, and you can think of these as the on-ramps for events to come into the system. There's a variety of these for, for different cloud services, for different um, middleware brokers. I probably shouldn't have used the term broker, or maybe we shouldn't have used the term broker in eventing, but when, when I say broker here, I mean uh, like, uh, MQ broker type thing, uh, or Kafka. <clears throat> so there are a number of different event sources that are the on-ramps for events to come into the system. And of course, you can build your own if the exact one that you want doesn't exist. Inside the system, using that uh, like transportation analogy, there's something called a channel. 
and you can think of this as a, a channel is the road that an event that's come on to that on-ramp travels through the system using. And uh, these are basically uh, forwarding and eventing persistence layer. There's an in-memory implementation that's maybe more suitable for development, but then there are also flavors backed by different durable stores like ActiveMQ or Kafka. And uh, again, these are the roads that events travel over. And continuing that analogy to just one final API resource, subscriptions are what connects events that are traveling in channels to their consumers. So like maybe you can think about the subscription as like the garage door. So you get in through the on-ramp, you travel along the road, and then you go to where your destination is by passing through that subscription garage door. Um, and the receiver on the other end of that subscription can be a K-native service, but it can also be a normal deployment or something else. So those are kind of the first generation eventing resources. More recently, we've got uh, what you might call eventing mesh APIs. And the central thing there that we'll talk about is the broker. The broker is an entity that can send and receive messages from multiple sources and subscribers. Brokers work with triggers uh, where the trigger sits between the, um, the broker and the receiver of the event and implements filtering. So uh, if you don't want every event that's going into a broker to be received by a particular receiver, you can use a trigger to filter those events out. And then there are some additional higher level APIs, and we, we, we're thinking here about patterns of en enterprise integration. Uh, there's a sequence that allows you to wire an ordered series of subscribers and sort of generates the channel and subscriber setup that you need to pass from A to B to C to D. And then there's another variant uh, called a parallel that allows you to wire a fan out to multiple subscribers and associate filters with all of those. Nice. So kind of mm -hmm. drawing a diagram with, with those uh, APIs, you would get uh, this diagram here where, again, you see at the top, the idea of the broker again you're saying you're seeing all the different sources and the multiple event types going so two one and three there it should be a three uh but then you see that the broker then is doing the filtering and say hey these types of events i'm sending to this application that's represented by a sync and then this other type of event i'm filtering right and sending to a different sync yep. that this this built-in routing and filtering mechanism is again, it's really powerful and it can implement, it can be used to implement many of these uh, EIPs. Uh, and then mm -hmm. as Paul Cooper, right, the channel, again, just adding a diagram to that, the idea here is that you essentially could have multiple sources sending different event types, but that channel now will carry that event and send all of those events to the subscribers, right? That's where the subscription comes into play and your application would be a sync there. But keep in mind, again, as Paul said, that the sync could be uh, a K-native service, it could be a URI, right? And, and it could be just a Kubernetes deployment as well. So this is what's coming as far as GA, and we're gonna see a little demo of that as well toward the end. But there's another thing that OpenShift Serverless also does to, to K-native. I would say we extend K-native with functions. And functions is something that people often associate whenever they hear the word serverless. Uh, but what we want to make sure that people understand, and one of the key differences between just serverless containers and serverless functions is really what goes inside the container that your application will be running, right? So whenever you're doing a serverless container, or building a serverless container, you're responsible for what goes inside that container, right? We don't we, we have some very small uh, uh, requirements there. For example, we want to send those events through an HTTP request, but those applications can still receive, of course, cloud events as part of the payload or just any HTTP request. So this is a very good way for you to uh, package or reuse current microservices that you have or any containerized application that you might have that fits this model 
and run that application as serverless. So now that application can scale up and down, can receive events, et cetera, et cetera. And you can use, of course, any programming language of choice. You can package whatever you want inside that container. Now, when you transition to this serverless functions model, that's where you get this extra piece of code that is the function runtime. And the function runtime really helps you as far as implementing this HTTP server, this wrapper around uh, how you're going to receive those events and how those events are going to be sent to your user code. Uh, and also, because we are in control of that function runtime, we can be a little bit more opinionated about it. So for example, maybe there is something specific that we want to do as far as tracing, we can package that tracing capability in our function runtime, where in a container, you can still, of course, have some choices and decide to choose your own implementation or go in a different route there. So that will, that will be the, the, the difference here. Now, looking at most solutions in the market today, I would say that, again, quite often, you have to choose between one or the other, uh, and they have completely different user experiences. I think the main difference that OpenShift Serverless is, is bringing to market here is this idea of running serverless containers and functions in the same experience, right? You have the same exact user flow. You can go back and forth. You may start with a container, and you may see a good fit for a benefiting from a function or vice versa. You can start with a function and say, you know what? I actually want to do certain things that I don't have a function runtime for. I want to run that application as a container now. So you can choose to go either way. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great quality for us to have because if we look at how folks tend to use uh, functions and microservices that like it, it's very common to have a spectrum of things that maybe you've got some microservices that uh, that evolve out of functions and maybe some microservices that you already had that you want to uh, you want to get the benefit of event activating those things uh, and scale to and from zero but you also have things that you're implementing as functions so it's it's nice that we treat them uh, similarly because there is that interplay and back and forth and evolution of systems that we maybe start out using functions and evolve to microservices or decompose a microservice into functions. Yep, yep, that's super powerful. So essentially what we are doing with, with functions then, right? We wanna make sure that you inherit and, and benefit from everything Knative already provides. So what we are doing is really uh, providing a plugin to KN. KN is a CLI for Knative. And that plugin, we are calling it FAST for now, uh, that plugin allows you to have a local developer experience, which again is super important if you want to iterate really fast and you may not have access to a cluster or to the cloud all the time. So again, you can have a local build experience and iterate. Uh, but when you build, we want to make sure that the way you are producing those containers is also standardized. So we are leveraging build packs for that. Uh, and we are already providing build packs for three runtime out of the box. So Quarkus, Node, and Go. Uh, but that list, of course, will extend as we progress in our journey from developer preview to technology preview. But once you build those containers using the fast CLI, you can then, of course, deploy. And when you deploy, they become Knative services, right? That's, again, all the things that we talked about here for serving our eventing, they apply. And some of the things that you see as well as far as developer experience, they still apply as well. And then. Another important aspect, like we said, is that you may want to build web apps, just vanilla web apps. You can do that with functions too. It's a very common pattern. You can implement single page apps or things of that nature. But the, one of the most powerful use cases for, for functions and servers, of course, is to deal with events. So you can receive cloud events with your functions as well. And we're going to see a little bit of that experience in, in the demo now that I, I pre-recorded to make sure I could talk and uh, speak. Uh, I, sorry, I could talk and not be concerned with typing at the same time. Uh, let me start sharing my screen here and I will walk through that. And then if we have enough time, I can do also like a little live demo of our console as well. So I'll hit play here. So I have an empty directory and the very first command we're going to do, let me do a quick pause there, is 
kn fez init, and I'm going to specify what type of function that is, so that the template that the tool will generate is already configured for that particular type. So it could be events. Again, it's going to then receive cloud events or HTTP. And then the dash L is going to be used to specify what programming language you want to use for the runtime. In this case, we're picking Node. So now triggering a build, again, is KN fast build. Notice that, of course, I'm not specifying any particular details about uh, a Docker file. There's nothing like that that we are requiring a developer to do. And here below, you can see the template, the function itself that got generated. And because I selected cloud events, you see that the context is uh, sending your application uh, a cloud event. That's kind of how you can extract the cloud event and the data from that context inside your function. But this is all the code that you have now in order to uh, process a cloud event. Not that the build is done. I'm just going to perform a deploy. And on the left side, you see the OpenShift console. So here I already have two Knative services running, one Quarkus one and another Spring application, and they are connected to a channel. Remember that Paul explained that a channel is this path that is going to carry events from event sources to your application. So here I have two event sources, just for the sake of demo, I'm using a Jira event source and a ping source, which is kind of a timer, right? Just to keep sending events to those applications. But now I just deploy the function. And as you can see, it's going to land in that topology view inside OpenShift, just like any other application. And now I can just wire that application, literally drag and dropping. I mean, I can use a CLI as well for that. KN provides a, a, a few commands that you can use to do the same thing and subscribe to a channel and subscribe to an event source. But here I'm literally just drag and dropping using the, the UI. And now I'm going to subscribe that function to that same channel. So now every update on Jira or every event that this timer will trigger, they will land on this microservice that is built in Quarkus, on this Spring application that is also another microservice, and on this function that we just deployed using uh, uh, the function functionality of OpenShift Serverless, which is built in JavaScript. So again, very short, very simple, but still I'd say very, very interesting and very powerful. <laughs> Now, one of the things that I want to just uh, call attention to, if if we can just pause this here, is that if you look at the channel that uh, that is the has the little binary type of uh, text on it, you'll notice that's an in-memory channel, um, and that is something that uh, is probably workable for you as a developer in production, where you don't want to have the chance of lost events. You'd probably be backing that with something like a Kafka. Yeah, so let's take a look at the topology view. And now I'm going a little bit off script here, but just to show you a live cluster as well. Uh, we recorded that so I could probably talk and do the demo at the same time. But first thing here, so this experience, this, this visualization that you're seeing here is really the way we are uh, uh, showing multiple revisions for one application. And in this case, you can see that this application, this, this particular revision has 100% of the traffic. And then I have this other applications here that are essentially representing PRs, uh, the number of the PR that uh, was triggered, uh, that was sent, and that triggered a pipeline that built this container as a revision here. They all have 0% of the traffic. But as I hit those URLs, you see that they will start from zero but they all have unique URLs. So again, this is the 14, the PR 14. This is the PR 15. But if I hit, of course, the main URL for the service, that is going to trigger the one that has 100% of the traffic. Now, for this experience, again, you can, of course, tweak the traffic split using the CLI. But we also offer, offer a way for you to do that using the UI as well. So I can say, you know what? I think. This one here will take 50% of the traffic, and I want the, the latest PR. That's the, the one I think it's good to take 15% of the 50% of the traffic. And now you see. So now if I hit the URL, the main URL, I'll have a 50% chance to hit any of these particular versions of my application. Uh, now, as far as the venting and to to build on what Paul just said, whenever you are creating a channel, 
we offer uh, an experience where, again, you can just select in memory and that's going to create a one in memory channel, or you can select Kafka, right? And now you need to inform, of course, uh, what Kafka broker you want to use that was already pre-configured for the eventing installation in this cluster. And you can literally just specify the name of the broker here. So let's say my broker, and that's going to be then backed by a Kafka channel for a durable and more reliable uh, persistency, right? When sending and receiving events. And the last piece I'll share very briefly here is the event source experience as well. These are some of the event sources that we have out of the box. Again, you can select Kafka. That's, of course, one very popular one. You can just point to the bootstrap server and start receiving events. Or you can pick any of the event sources powered by CamOK. So let's say I can pick SQS. You provide the, the, the configuration here. For now, this experience is uh, YAML. We are working on that to make sure that we have forms auto-generated for event sources as well. But it's in a very simple configuration, just of course your keys and the queue name for SQS, hit create, and that's going to create uh, the event source for you. So I'll do one for Kafka here, because that's of course one thing that I have already running in my OpenShift cluster. Uh, pick the consumer group. Uh, and here I'm, I'm gonna select, so I could use a URI. So this could be any destination, any URI that can receive that Kafka message or yep. an application. And in this case, I'm just going to select the previous application that I built and hit create. You see that now I have a Kafka source connected to this serverless application to send and receive events. Now, one of the things that uh, I, I thought would probably be good to just disambiguate um, in case there was any question is that when we talk about the Kafka source, this would be something that you would use to consume events that were in a Kafka topic. So as opposed to Kafka backing a channel where the Kafka topic is a durable store for events, this is if you actually wanted to consume events that were in a Kafka topic, right, William? Right, that's correct. Yeah, I was just demonstrating how the experience would be, again, if you want to connect now your in-memory channel to your application and then eventually land uh, the event source to this channel here as well. Now, I am running a 4.5 nightly, a 4.6 nightly build, so maybe there is something here that my drag and drop is not doing properly, but you get the idea, right? Uh, I'll go back to the slides now. I guess one, one brief thing that I would just point out is this integration that we did with pipelines as well, which again, it allows you to produce a, a Tekton pipeline out of the box whenever you are importing an application from Git. And I'll just very quickly show you that. I know we are getting close on time, but let's say I'll pick one particular application here. So I'll pick this the vanilla spring application from upstream, uh, select Java, select Knative service. And now here I can select add a pipeline. So this is going to generate a Tekton pipeline that can be used to build my application. And you see that again, I had not to create this pipeline from scratch. This was just part of the import flow from Git. When I hit create, that it's going to then start a build and eventually, right, you see the build is new, the build will be updated to running and your application will be completed here. And when I go to pipeline, you see that there is a new pipeline that was created and you can still configure that pipeline if you want using either the pipeline builder, right? Adding more steps to your pipeline if you want or editing the YAML. So very, very interesting experience. And again, very easy to get started as well. Let me go back to the slides, stop sharing my screen real quick. So this is pretty much all we had. Anything else you want to talk about, Paul, today? Or is this an, inter an interesting enough update for folks today? Well, I always have trouble uh, calibrating to that. It doesn't get easier when there's no heads nodding in the room that you can kind of look at. Uh, but I think I think we've hit folks with a lot of information. So I'll just say 
thanks a lot for watching our session, everybody, and hope uh, hope that you can check out OpenShift Serverless and the Knative project. We'd love to have you contribute. Uh, love to have you involved in the Knative community. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Gito, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach both of us on Twitter. Yeah, thank you, folks. Bye. All right, see ya.